All right. So I'm going to do a little bit of a review since it's been a while since we've done all this jazz. And then uh, we'll get moving forward. All right, so what do we get for the first one? Broad strokes, tell me this is the functional group I end up with. An alcohol, or in this case a diol, and an acid, and a carbonyl compound. What am I gonna get? No. So the first part of it is cyclic, and then what's the second word? Cyclic acetal, right? So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There you go. You get a cyclic acetal. What about the next one? The secondary amine and toxic acid with a carbonyl compound. Mm hmm take off the oxygen, that's where you put the nitrogen. But since it's a secondary amine, you don't make an imine. You make an ene amine. They put spring break, like, exactly in the start of the semester to get guarantee maximum carnage. Just not, it was not the best, not the best for you guys. All right, what about this last one? Yep. So make a cyanohydrin. I add CN to the carbonyl carbon. All right, so there are those. So I feel like spring break says to you guys what summer vacation used to do to me. The number of times between the ages of like seven and like 12 that in like July, I was like, oh my God, have I forgotten how to write? Am I going to remember how to write by the time I go back to school? Right. It was like every year I was like, oh gosh, I hope this isn't the year I forgot how to like make letters. And some, somewhere yesterday evening, you're like, oh my God, what's a carbon? Have I forgotten all of organic chemistry this last week? Oh no. What do these lines mean? I'm screwed. All right, what is what is this first one here? What what functional group do I make? Make a hydrate. Zoom coming in strong. So I'm just like I've been in my little screen screen world for the last few month a uh, few weeks. It's fine. I didn't I didn't forget anything. So what am I getting for the next one? Getting another acetal here since I just have an alcohol, right? Not a diol. It is an acyclic acetal. So I'm going to add two of that alcohol to the carbonyl carbon to get my product. The question was, does it matter how you arrange the carbons on the acetal? Yeah, it doesn't matter how you like arrange your uh, carbons. As long as they're both O-ethyl, doesn't matter how they're arranged. But for this last one, it does matter how you arrange the carbons. Yes, they're trans to one another. So when you make an imine, so you replace the oxygen with a nitrogen. Since it's a primary amine, you get the C double bond O, or sorry, the C double bond N. And because it's an aldehyde, you want to make sure that the carbon groups on the carbonyl carbon and on the nitrogen are trans to one another. Right? You want to put them as far apart from each other as you possibly can. Right? Where if you had a ketone, you would get a mixture of products.
and I wouldn't care which one you made, right? Aldehyde, I want you to always make the trans isomer, right? If you start with an aldehyde and you're making an imine, make sure that the, nit the carbon on the nitrogen is as far away from the carbons on the carbonyl carbon as they can get. If you have a ketone, just make me an imine. Make sure that you have the same number of carbons on the nitrogen as you started with in your primary amine, and I'm good. Reasonable? This is almost everything we did the week before uh, you went away. We've done all of this before. This is all review, man. All right. One last thing on this that I don't know if I went over before we left. All right, so again, we're going to make an amine. All right. Right. The byproduct that we get from this reaction is we make water, right? And if you remember the mechanism, I know, big ask, all the steps in the mechanism are in equilibrium, meaning that we can go all the way back to our starting material from our product, right? So what this means is if you have an imine and you add water and acid, you can go back to your carbonyl group plus the amine you started with. Right, our acids here are usually tosic acid, PPTS, or sulfuric acid. Right, so since you make water as a byproduct here, you're actually able to go all the way back because all the steps are in equilibrium that if you add a bunch of water and acid, you go all the way back to your carbonyl compound. So this works for imines. The same thing is true for enamines. Right, if you have an enamine, water and acid, same acids. you'll get back to your carbonyl compound and your amine. So we had talked about doing these reactions with just amines. But there are other nitrogen nucleophiles that we can use that are gonna lead to different functional groups. So we have other nitrogen nucleophiles. Okay. So I want to go over what the nitrogen nucleophiles are, right? So basically we can take this reaction that we've been doing, right, an acid, and we can change the amine out for other nitrogen containing compounds and make slight variations on the amine structure. So the first structure we can have is we can have a nitrogen bonded to an oxygen, single bonded to an oxygen, either as an OH or as an ether. In either way, this is called a hydroxyl amine. So this is one nitrogen nucleophile we can use. You can have your nitrogen single bonded to another nitrogen. This is a hydrazine. And then you can have this structure here, which is a semi 
carb uh, carbazide. So each one of these, when they react with a carbonyl, like a ketone or an aldehyde, are going to give you a different structure that is related to, but not exactly the same as an imine. So when you have a hydroxylamine, right? So you have your hydroxylamine and your PPTS, right? You're going to make an imine that has an oxygen on it. So this is an oxime. Now it doesn't matter if it's a nitrogen single bonded to an OH or if it's a nitrogen, bonded, nitrogen single bonded to an ether. They're both still oxymes. Again, an oxygen. If you have hydrazine, which is the same stuff that we used when we made luminol way back at the beginning of the semester. If we have hydrazine and you make the carbon nitrogen double bond, it's a hydrozone. You get in the zone, hydrozone. Yeah, you'll be 70 and you'll still remember the auto zone, zone theme song. Like, oh my gosh, I've heard this 8 million times in my life. Now, we can put different groups on the nitrogen and this still works but what we need is we need to make sure that one of the nitrogens is always an nh2 so if i were to have like nh2 and it's a two methyl groups right the nitrogen that has the two hydrogens on it is going to be the one that makes the carbon nitrogen double bond. So still a hydrozone, even though you've got two methyl groups on your nitrogen. Right, if you just have like one group on your nitrogen, Still, the nitrogen that has the two hydrogens is going to be the one that reacts. Right? And that makes sense because what you have to make is a byproduct in this reaction. Right? You have to end up making water. And kind of the simplest way is, right, these two hydrogens and this oxygen make that water. So I need to have the two hydrogens on the nitrogen so I can spit out water. So semi-carbazide can react, but here I have three nitrogens in the molecule. How can I pick which nitrogen is going to react and make a carbon nitrogen double bond? So the nitrogen out here furthest from the C double bond O is the most reactive nitrogen. So its lone pairs are always available to be able to go add to an electrophile, to be able to add to a carbonyl carbon or some other electrophile. The other two nitrogens, their lone pairs are tied up in resonance, right? So we could see We took this, kicked these electrons down and up.
right? So the lone pairs there on that on that nitrogen, right? Some of the time they're being used in resonance and they're actually hanging out on the oxygen, right? Or they're in a carbon nitrogen double bond. They're not always free to do nucleophilic chemistry because they're making resonance structures. Same with the electrons on the other nitrogen. So over here, right, same deal. Right, I get a resonance structure where those electrons are being used to make a resonance structure and now they're not available to go add to something. The only nitrogen that 100% of the time has its lone pair available to do chemistry is the nitrogen on the end for this from the C double bond O. So we're gonna react at that nitrogen because that nitrogen is just always gonna have that lone pair. So same stuff we were doing before. Right, we can take this and then add our semi-carboside. React with the nitrogen that is furthest from the carbonyl. We make a semi carbazone. Now, I'm not going to ever put any other substituents on the semi carbazide. So, you're just going to have to worry about this one like base structure here. I'm not going to put in like methyls or ethyls or anything on it. I'm just going to use that. So, there are three functional groups out of this that I want you to like know that I will be willing to put on your functional group part of your exam. Like, I guarantee one or two will be there. And that is, I want you to know oxime, hydrozone, In semi carbazone. So I want you to know those three functional groups. Seem doable? Hmm? For now, we feel they seem good? Okay. We're almost done with this set of slides. It's fine. All right. So the last thing we have to go over with the nitrogen as a nucleophile stuff is something called reductive amination. Right, so this is going to be a way that you can make secondary and tertiary amines from ketones and aldehydes. All right, so you have the basically the conditions you would use to make uh, an imine or an enamine, depending on which kind of if you're starting with a primary or secondary mean, right? But then you add, in this mixture, you add sodium cyanoborohydride. We're going to pretend my arrow is long enough. There you go. So, so you can actually NaCn in parentheses 
B H three. Right. What this does is instead of making the carbon nitrogen double bond, you reduce it and you make an amine straight away. So sodium cyanide borohydride is a source of H minus. That hydrogen ends up being bonded to the carbonyl carbon. Sodium cyanide borohydride is a very weak source of hydride. So right, normally we've seen sodium borohydride, right? And if you add sodium borohydride to a ketone or an aldehyde, it's gonna turn them into alcohols, right? Well, sodium cyanide borohydride can't reduce ketones and aldehydes. The only thing sodium cyanide borohydride can reduce is aminium ions. Think about the mechanism of making um, amines, right? If you go through all the steps, we're gonna like fast forward. Right, if you go through the steps, you get to, oops. Aluminium, right? So right before you make the imine, right? The very last structure in the mechanism is this aluminium ion, where you have one extra hydrogen on your nitrogen, right? And you just have to pull that off and that gives you your imine. This is where sodium cyanoborohydride jumps in so once you make the aluminium ion, sodium cyanoborohydride can reduce only this aluminium ion. It's the only thing in the whole mechanism that the sodium cyanoborohydride can react with. And it will reduce that ion to give you your product, right? So we can add, we can mix everything together all at once. We can mix the amine, we can mix the acid, we can mix the carbonyl and the sodium cyanide borohydride all together because the only thing that sodium cyanide borohydride reacts with is aluminium ions. It ignores everything else. So this is a good way to make secondary and tertiary amines, right? So you can start with, like we just did, right? You can say, hey, here's my ketone. Here is a primary amine. Right, this is going to make a secondary amine as my product. Right, so primary amine is going to lead to a secondary amine as your product, right? A nitrogen that's gonna have two carbons bonded on it. And it doesn't matter if you are using a ketone or an aldehyde as your starting carbonyl compound. Bracket. 
you're still going to make a secondary amine. Right, so primary amine with re under reductive amination conditions, always going to give you a secondary amine as your product. You change when you go from a primary amine to a secondary amine. So if you're using a secondary amine, you're going to make tertiary amines as your product. So when you have a secondary amine, you're going to end up making a tertiary amine as your product. And again, it doesn't matter if you're using a ketone or an aldehyde. All that matters is the type of amine that you're using. All right, so your carbonyl carbon is bonded right to that nitrogen. So you just take off your hydrogen and then put the carbon chain that's bonded to your carbonyl on the nitrogen. That's it. Feeling good? Seems thoroughly doable, hopefully, maybe. All right, so we've talked about how to turn carbon oxygen double bonds into a whole bunch of different things, right? But one of the big things we need to be able to do in organic chemistry is we need to be able to make carbon carbon bonds. So we can turn carbon-oxygen double bonds into carbon-carbon double bonds. Step one, Jude was German. It's more of a V sound. There's a Wittig reaction. Don't hit me with the... Is it wit, wittig? No, wittig. Right. The German guy in the room gave me the thumbs up, so I did it right. It's a little, little stressed. He's like, well, actually, it's not actually a V. It's more of a, like, no, no, I just, I'm dumb American. V is all I got. Right. So, wittig reaction. So, here you take a carbonyl compound and you react it with a Phosphorus ilid. We'll come back to that in a second. And you make a double bond plus you make triphenylphosphine oxide. Right, so triphenylphosphine oxide is very, very, very stable. And so um, this is the driving force for the reaction. So basically making triphenylphosphine oxide is what lets this reaction go. So Carbon-oxygen double bonds are actually more stable than carbon-carbon double bonds, right? 
So we're going uphill in energy if you're just looking at C double bond O energies versus C double bond C energies, right? But triphenylphosphine oxide is so stable, we get so much energy from making this really stable phosphorus oxygen double bond. It lets us overcome the fact that we're kind of uphill in energy going from C double bond O to C double bond C. The downside of triphenylphosphine oxide is just a stuff of nightmares. It like never separates from your compound. It's like insoluble garbage. It's just awful, awful stuff. But we have to make it for these reactions to work. And we don't have any other way, better ways to make double bonds. So we're stuck with it, right? So I just kind of threw Illid out at you. He's like, Illid. And you guys were like, yeah, Illid, sure. So an Illid is, so let's draw our compound here. Let's use a generic R group. So an inlet is a compound that has separated charges, but is stable. And you're looking at this and you're like, I don't see any charges. Old man's slipping. Um, well, it actually likes to hang out in its resonance structure. It acts more like this, where you've got the phosphorus has a positive charge and the carbon has a negative charge. Right? So the Wittig reagent behaves more like this, more like its illid form. Okay. And I think that the illid form is the easiest way to think about the mechanism and how this reaction actually works. So if we want to look at the mechanism, so if we want to look at it, you guys are like, we don't want to look at it. Right, so right, we'll do just a generic We'll just put a methyl group on here, right? We'll make a simple double bond. So the mechanism, right? We're gonna think of the phosphorus reagent being in its charged form, right? So I've got this carbanion and it's gonna do what carbanions have done to carbonyl compounds kind of all through this all through this chemistry, which is it's going to add to the carbonyl carbon, push electrons up onto the oxygen. So now we get this negatively charged oxygen beside this positively charged phosphorus. Phosphorus and oxygen really like making bonds. So we're going to have them add have the oxygen add to the phosphorus. And the structure that you get in this formid ring is called an oxyphosphatane. Basically, just a fancy way of saying a four membered ring that has an oxygen and a phosphorus in it. Now this compound falls apart into our double bond and our triphenylphosphine oxide. So these electrons come up here to make the phosphorus oxygen double bond and the electrons from the phosphorus and the carbon come down in this oxidation state, phosphorus can only make five bonds. So it has to give some electrons to the carbon. And so I'm gonna draw it like this so it's hopefully a little easier to see. So there's my double bond. And then here's my triphenylphosphine oxide. Right. You can think about it that these electrons right here are the electrons that end up being in that double bond. And then these electrons right here are the electrons that end up being in that double bond. So you just move the electrons around. 
and you get your two double bonds. So far, so good. So let's look at some examples. The mechanism's not too super complicated, but let's look at some examples. So kind of the easiest version of this, right, is what we just saw, which is you have your triphenylphosphine, you have your illid, right? And whatever is on the carbon double bonded to the phosphorus, that carbon and everything attached to it is just going to replace the oxygen of your carbonyl compound, right? So you're just gonna basically say like, hey, oxygen, you're getting replaced with, what, what, with whatever is on my phosphorus, right? So that carbon that was red is just right there, it's replacing the oxygen. You can put two groups on your phosphorus, right? You have two groups on that carbon double bond of the phosphorus, that's fine. Now you're gonna make a tetra substituted double bond. As long as one of your components, either your carbonyl or your Wittig reagent is symmetrical, right? The groups are the same, right? You don't get a mixture of products, right? So here, right, I've got two methyl groups here and here. That's the, car the carbonyl symmetrical. Uh, next one, again, carbonyl symmetrical. If my carbonyl is not symmetrical, right? Say I have this and then I use a Wittig reagent that is also not symmetrical, I'm gonna end up with a mixture of products, right? Because some percentage of the time, my isopropyl group's gonna be on the same side as my ethyl. And some percentage of the time when I make it, my isopropyl group is going to be on the same side as my methyl. I am not gonna have you try to figure out which one is major and which one is minor. Because sometimes, even though you think, oh, it should be really easy to know which one's which, it might only be like 55, 45, like they're really close. So basically pick one. I know our tests right now are multiple choice. So if you're like, it's one of these two, find the one, find which one I gave you, that's the right answer, right? But just pick one, don't get hung up on the fact that yes, there is a mixture, but it's gonna be hard for you to predict. So same thing, let's say you're, right, let's say you have a, but now your ketone's not symmetrical, but your illid is, right? Now you don't have a mixture again. Now you're back to a nice, easy example where you only get one product. So for, ketones, I'm just going to say, hey, pick one. But there's one particular case with aldehydes that you 100% only ever make one product. So that is if you have an aldehyde and you have a monosubstituted illid, so you've only got one group on the carbon bond of the phosphorus, you always make the cis product. So you always put that carbon group on the same side as the carbons from the aldehyde. Always 100% cis. It doesn't really matter what the groups are on the aldehyde and on the illid, you're still just always going to make this cis product. When you don't have this, if you have two groups on your phosphorus illid, then we're back to like, you can get mixtures and stuff. And this only works if you have a mono substituted illid.
So if I were to go to, you know, same out of high, but now I have an illib that's not symmetrical, right? Now I'm going to get a mixture of this plus this, right? And again, pick one. The only one that I'm going to say 100% you have to put only one isomer or know you only make one isomer is aldehyde plus mono substituted illid. That's the one that 100% of the time is you're going to know what the double bond geometry is. Now, same kind of thing if your illid is symmetrical, right? You're only going to make one product because it doesn't matter which side the ethyl group's on because they're both ethyl groups. And again, right, if it's a ketone that's not symmetrical, you're going to get a mixture. That makes sense? Seem reasonable? Right, so you're always just going to, you're basically you're just always saying, hey, group double bond, carbon double bond is my phosphorus, you take the place of the oxygen in all of these examples. And then just when you have the aldehyde with an illid that has one group on it, that's the only time you have to be 100% locked in on the stereochemistry. And that means it has to be cis. So next time we're gonna talk about where illids come from. Uh, pro tip, not the chemistry stork. Though I do like the idea of like a bird carrying like a little basket of chemicals to your like lab or something. Just like flies in uh, uh, and drops it off. You're like, oh God.